Kyle. Thanks so much for joining Speaking Of. I'm Stephanie Fields, and today I am joined by Leanne Tripp, who is the author of Finding the Rainbow, The Other Side of a Cancer Journey, and who is also a longtime friend of mine. I'm so excited to have you here today, Leanne. Thank you, Steph. It's great to see you. Great to be here. Can you please share a little bit about your journey? Yeah, sure. Um, so the journey really began in 2014. Um, at that time, I had a four-year-old little girl. Um, and I was pregnant with my second. Um, towards the end of my pregnancy, I started noticing some changes in my vision, as well as like almost a tingling sensation on the one side of my of my face. And um, I hadn't really put those two symptoms together. So I went to an eye doctor. They didn't see any problems. I went to my ob told them about the trickling. Um, they thought that that was maybe just a weird symptom of pregnancy. And then I had my son at the end of October, um, two months later, when I noticed that my vision had gotten worse, um, I ended up seeing a neurologist, having an MRI, and then being diagnosed with a, a very rare type of brain tumor. Um, it's called a diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. Um, it's uh, the type of tumor that typically presents in children, young children. Um, it has a really abysmal survival rate. I think it's 0% in children, which is terrible. Um, but when it presents in adults, it tends to behave a little differently because for children, their brains aren't formed yet. And so it's a devastating uh, type of tumor. But in adults, it does uh, present a little differently. Um, so long story short, I was treated after going through um, second, third, fourth, uh, even fifth uh, opinions. I ended up getting treated with radiation. And in 2015, um, I was in a mode of just kind of serial MRI observation. I've now been declared in remission. Um, and so with remission, I found that that journey, that, that part of my cancer journey was where I really struggled and didn't expect to struggle. So um, I wrote Finding the Rainbow to talk about that part of the journey and hopefully share some aspects of that piece of the journey and the entire journey to really give anyone who's going through a significant life-changing uh, event, whether that's a cancer diagnosis or, or other traumatic event, to give them a little bit of hope and hopefully some inspiration in their journey as well. What are those moments like when you're I think there'd probably be so many different ones, you know, when you're pregnant and you're having these issues and then you go to the doctor and you keep getting confirmation that you're okay. And then mm -hmm. you, nothing subsides and gets worse and you get devastating news. And then what, what is life like at that point? You know, what are those phases where it's like relief? It seems like a roller coaster, relief, terror, what now kind of process. Right, right. Um, yeah, it's a great question. You know, for me, um, when I when I got the news that it was a, a, a glioma, um, I, I really didn't know what that meant. Um, and so um, to later learn that uh, a DIPG is a really deadly type of brain tumor um, was obviously, you know, shocking and, and, and horrible and a very dark part of my life. But for me, and I think for most people, um, there's a lot of resiliency um, that most people have. And you find that you may be surprised at your own strength when it's called to serve you and those moments of true despair. And so when I was going through the um, absorbing the news, I just kind of, you know, had this mantra that it's just going to be fine it, because it has to be right. There's nothing else it could be. It was going to be fine. I was going to get through my treatment um, and I was just sort of in survival mode. And I was also, you know, protected by the love and care of my friends like you and my family. And so I felt like I could get through that survival stage um, well. But for me, the unsettling piece came later with remission, which people typically often associate with celebration and, you know, amazingness, and it is all those things, but it also is a period of just feeling like you're um, in like a proverbial kind of purgatory, right? Like you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. 
you're waiting for the bad news to come. And so it took a lot of work and introspection in my part to kind of stabilize through that because I was noticing that remission was bringing out really weird triggers in myself um, that I hadn't realized until I took a good look at, you know, my everyday behaviors and what was kind of causing me to have pockets of emotional turbulence. Um, so that's the kind of partly why I titled the book, The Other Side of the Cancer Journey, because I made it on the other side of the cancer journey. I'm now in remission. Um, you know, to see me, to know me, you probably wouldn't know that I have a brain tumor. Um, but in addition to that, the book is really about the other side of a cancer journey that doesn't get talked about a lot. At least when I was diagnosed and going through it, I don't recall seeing, you know, or reading about people struggling with remission because that seems to be the end goal is to get to remission. And it absolutely is. But there were still some things that um, that I was surprised, um, some struggles that I was surprised to find in that period. There are so many things in what you just said. You know, it's interesting mm -hmm. how you said people don't talk about the remission piece because I think, you know, there's other things that people don't often talk about, miscarriage, mental health, things that are becoming more talked about. But for those, I think there's different reasons. I think there's a shame around it. But remission, it almost seems like maybe people are afraid to talk about that being a scary part because either they're afraid that they might get shut down because people are like, but you've already done it. You can do this. You don't, you know, you don't need to worry, like making them almost like gaslighting that like, this mm -hmm. isn't a scary thing. Right. You know, or is, is it just like, how can you be complaining about this? Like you've gotten through it, you know? So I wonder if there's some of that that keeps people from holding back, but I agree with you. I thankfully have not had cancer, but I've known far, far too many people who have many have made it through and other people have not sadly. And also, you know, I've been super open about the fact that my daughter was in the NICU, which was a really scary time. And she had a very serious condition then. And it's like during the, that time that you're going through things, there is so much support and rallying around it. And, you know, you have that oomph behind it. But then you're OK. Like, OK, she got home from the NICU. OK, you finished your cancer treatment. You rung the bell. You did all the things. And mm -hmm. then for other people, like their life then continues, you know, and then but you're like, oh, my God but that's not the same for me. You you can't erase what happened and take that out of there. So I feel like it is mm -hmm. a really important part of things to talk about because it, it is kind of part of you forever. And when you and I talked before, one of the things that you said was uh, that gave you peace was whenever you went to your oncologist and they said your, I can't remember your diagnosis or prognosis is unknown at this point, you know, mm -hmm. which now is the same as everybody else. So tell us why that meant so much to you to be able to be back on that playing field. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I was in a mode after my treatment of getting those serial MRIs and um, I'd have the MRI and then I'd go to the clinic like the next day and they would tell me in the beginning, it was effectively if you have six months to live or if you need to get your affairs in order. And I would always ask, in those appointments, you know, what do you think my prognosis is beyond six months? Like, could you give me a ballpark? Is it a couple of years? And I would always get the kind of the same variation on the answer of, well, we don't know for sure. We don't have a crystal ball, but it's typically, you know, five years, five to 10, something like that. Um, and they didn't love that question. The physicians did not love that question. It made them uncomfortable, um, you know, they have to be careful about what they say, of course, but patients have a right to know their prognosis. And in one of the appointments, it was probably a couple of years after I was in kind of treatment and in observation mode, I asked one of the physicians, so what is my prognosis? You know, I'm going to ask, what do you think? And he looked at me and he said, I know. And at first that felt scary. But once I kind of took it in, I liked it because unknown to me meant undefined. It meant I didn't have an expiration date. It meant that I had some hope and I had some opportunity and there's possibility between, behind the word unknown. Um, that was really a game changer for me because like you said, it, it effectively put me right on the same playing field as everyone else in the sense that you know, we're all unknown in the grand scheme of the universe. I could worry incessantly about, 
this tumor because it's still there. It's just shrunk and stabilized. It could mutate, it could change. Um, but in the, in the, in the, and while I worry about that, you know, I could get hit by a bus tomorrow, you know. Um, so it's not totally in our control. At least that's what I choose to believe. And so thinking about my prognosis as unknown was um, just uh, really reset my whole outlook on this journey of remission, um, which I call it like a remission. It's my second act in life. And it's my chance to kind of get things right and live a little more boldly, a little more bravely uh, and more courageously. And that was a gift that this journey gave me, um, perhaps ironically. Yeah. <laughs> I've noticed just from your own social media that you run a lot and that seems to have become something. Is that a coping mechanism for you? Is that empowerment? Is that that seems to have yeah. been a core booster in some way to your life in this this part of your life. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of like a form of meditation for me. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm a slow jogger, <laughs> but I like to do long distances because it gives me a chance to disconnect, um, you know, as, as women, as mothers, um, as professionals, we have so much, we're asked to give so much, but when I'm on a run, it's just me, you know, I'm, I don't have to be a, a wife or um, a, a sister or a mother or a cancer patient. I was finding that on those runs, it was just about me and, and my own kind of mental wellness. And so it's been, that's actually, yeah, that's been very th therapeutic and just processing all of this and and thinking back on the great lessons learned in this journey because I feel as though you know for the type of tumor that I have a DIPG like I said it's extraordinarily rare to be diagnosed as an adult um, we're talking less than like 200 patients in the United States right now have this type of tumor and so I wanted to make something of this story share something from this story um, and the runs definitely help me kind of do that self-reflection um, and meditation on what are the great lessons that I could share ha after having gone through all of this. And something else you did that in solitude was write this book. You said that you didn't tell anyone that you were doing this. What made you decide to just start writing and then to keep it to yourself until it was finished? What made me start kind of writing the story was also part of my therapy and process and processing this. And so I found that, you know, over the past few years, I've been gathering, collecting and sharing stories about this journey. Um, at the time I'd worked in healthcare marketing. So I was applying a lot of my patient experience to strategy and offering those up uh, at, in my workplace. And so um I thought, you know, I should really, if I, if I wrote all these stories out and I string them together, I'm sure I can find like a common thread here. Um, and so, you know, the writing process was actually went pretty quick for me because I already had the stories uh, there. I just had to kind of write them out and, and pull out the key themes throughout the book. Um, I wanted to keep it um, private. Um, because I didn't want any sort of outside noise influencing how I told this story. And I also wanted to um, give myself the gift of writing this and doing it all on my own um, as kind of the love letter to myself, having gone through the journey. So it was important to me that I that it was a private experience. Um, and I really just wanted to own it completely and let it be let it be mine. So, this was my third baby. <laughs> it's interesting no to me reading mm -hmm. it that you did start with birth, basically. You know, you said that you felt you've always felt different, that there was something that you were meant for greatness. And then you spent quite mm -hmm. a bit of time on your childhood and through your college years. Why mm -hmm. was it so important to you to provide all of that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I really feel like in order to understand who we are and how we've gotten to where we are, we have to take a look back at our roots and back at our history, at our own, you know, personal experiences um, to understand what kind of formed us as, as people. 
Um, and so that chapter was the hardest for me because I had to kind of really dig deep because I felt like I, I didn't really have um, an exciting past, like nothing that significant happened to me up until this diagnosis. So, um, but things did happen. And even small things um, were moments that I hope others can connect with and the way that I grew up and what kind of formed me, formed me as a person and really embedded some of the resiliency that I found through, through treatment and through managing this diagnosis. Um, and I think that, you know, just taking stock of my life was very again, therapeutic for me. I keep saying that word, but it was because it reminded me that I had a whole life before this cancer diagnosis. I was a, you know, I, I'm a whole person. And this, this cancer journey was a significant chapter in my life, but it's not the whole story, right? So just taking stock of those moments where I've struggled in the past helped me realize how I got through them to apply to, you know, my current struggles and situations. So um, I felt like also, if you weren't familiar with my story, you don't know anything about me, that it was important for those readers to understand a little bit about where I came from and, and how I got to be the person that I that I am today. How do you think you are now post diagnosis and remission versus if that never happened? How do you think yeah. things have changed? Yeah, that's a great question. So part of writing this book um, was inspired by a question I used to ask myself a lot, which was, did this cancer ruin my life? And there was definitely a period in my life where I would have said, yes, absolutely. Um, but looking back and really thinking through the journey, it, I can say now that it did not ruin my life. It changed my life. And in some ways, it gave me blessings that changed my life for the better. Um, like I said uh, earlier, to see me, you probably wouldn't know anything was going on. So I kind of carry this invisible illness. And having invisible illness um, really taught me to live more compassionately and, and taught me to realize that no matter what you see on the outsides, everyone is carrying something. You know, everyone goes through uh, very stressful and, and and tremendously painful events. And it doesn't matter what the event is, whether it's a cancer diagnosis, the loss of a job, the loss of a spouse, a child, the source is meaningless because the pain feels the same no matter where it's coming from. So recognizing that if I was carrying this, I can't imagine, you know, what other people are living with. So that compassion has helped me just approach the world in a little more of a gentler again, a uh, more compassionate way. It also helped me appreciate that, you know, the only moment we own is the present. And I know we all hear that and we're taught that, but sometimes it takes um, a, a really significant incident for us to really respect and appreciate that. And, and oddly, the fear of death, the threat of death helped me to live more fully, I believe, um, because I, I appreciate more. Um, and, you know, I'm, you know, trying to be on this remission of living a little more boldly and, um, and living a little more, um, appreciative of, of every moment that I have, because the present one is the only one we, we truly own, I believe. Absolutely. Why don't you tell us about your favorite story in the book or your favorite chapter <laughs> of the book? Cause I know you have some that are pretty special to you. <laughs> Yeah, I think the favorite chapter in the book is the one that I talk about as the healthcare curve, because I feel like we're all called to do something. And if we take some of our greatest struggles and we turn them into meaning, you know, what is this here to teach me? What is this here for me to use to contribute to the world? I would say it was walking the patient journey and being able to share the good, the bad, the ugly for anyone who will listen. Um, and so uh, again, when I was diagnosed, I was working in healthcare marketing. I worked in healthcare marketing for 15 years and was touting the world class this and the state of the art that. Um, but when I went through the cancer journey, it truly just took me to the patient at that patient level um, and helped me to to see that in, in hindsight, like looking back on everything, I really believe that the healthcare industry is graded on a curve by consumers. You know, we tolerate a lot of things that we wouldn't tolerate in other industries. 
Uh, we can sit on the phone for 20 minutes. We'll wait six months to get into a clinic that is a subspecialty. We will pay ridiculous bills that don't make any sense. We'll tolerate rude providers and say that they have poor bedside manners. Um, but I really believe, and a lot of those in the field now are seeing this, that that curve is getting shorter thanks to market disruptors. When you can get primary care through an app and you don't have to even go into a clinic, that's really a game changer. Um, and it's also you know, being fueled by the Amazon-like experiences that younger generations, our children, are going to be wired into where they won't tolerate uh, these kind of bad behaviors. They're going to expect care that is delivered in a frictionless kind of way on their terms, on demand, and the customer service needs to be exceptional um, because, you know, Amazon has been such a uh, uh, an influencer over not just retail, but all industries. You know, the ex the expectations it has put on consumers is now influencing the way that they find a doctor, the way they purchase a vehicle, insurance choose a college or university. So it's really having a tremendous impact on all, all aspects of consumerism and healthcare is no different. And so my message to healthcare providers and industry, and this is probably the most important message that I want to share is that they need to get on board with this now because it's not going to change anytime soon. Um, you know, this, the technology is not going to slow down. The expectations uh, won't change. Um, and so that's really what I, I wish to share. And, and also that, you know, I worked with a healthcare executive who had a great analogy for the patient experience. And I, and I always repeat this one. She used to say that, you know, if you work in healthcare, this is just another Monday. It's just a black and white kind of day. Um, they kind of run together. But for patients, the experience in healthcare is in full vivid color. They may have had a day circled on their calendar for months that it will become their healthcare experience. They may end up in an ER, not ever expecting that's how their day would, would unfold. They may have a, a child in the NICU that they could never have imagined would be placed there. And so every touch in that patient journey matters in terms of you know, their experience with the healthcare brand, their trust of the providers. And if at any point that trust is broken or the brand experience feels like there's friction, um, that's almost um, irrevocable. You know, you, you can't get that patient's trust back. And as more options become available to patients in the space of healthcare, um, that's going to be almost impossible. They're just going to have more places to go for their care. They don't have to be so reliant on those those local clinics. And and one last point on this, <laughs> and of course I'm hot, you know, this is my soapbox, my favorite chapter, is that um, you know, I went to some of the best clinics for those second, third, fourth, fifth opinions I was talking about. Um, at one clinic um, in New York City, which was one of the best, is one of the best cancer centers in the world. I had never in my life felt so defeated and so discouraged by the experience I had at that appointment, which was over in a matter of 15 minutes. Um, I felt very processed. I felt like I was just being, you know, just a box to get checked off from that provider. Um, and I experienced that at other facilities uh, as well that were really some of the best facilities again, in the, in the country, if not the world for cancer care. But the ones where I felt seen, heard, validated were some of the local clinics. Um, and I think that, you know, that that whole customer service piece in healthcare um, is one that is significant because it shapes how that patient feels and how, you know, they perceive those healthcare brands. So it's not just about having the most sophisticated technology, um, but it's also about also offering up that compassion and that human-based care that sometimes gets forgotten at bigger systems where they're focused on research and they're focused on RVUs and productivity. They also can't forget about the patient because that's that's what matters the most in the end. What are some of the things in your own journey that if you yeah. would have either would have existed, because now it's been close to 10 years, which is right. really hard to believe, right. but if they would have existed or if 
you know, some cases, things like compassion, that's, you know, mm-hmm. on a person to person level, and also, of mm-hmm. course, the culture of the healthcare organization as a whole, but things like that, what would you have gone through and changed or added? What would have supplemented that or what could have transformed some of those negative experiences into positive ones? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, the one thing I can think of, and and I warn people about this, is that you know, I can't speak for all physicians, certainly, but in just my experience, I found that doctors just weren't good at giving bad news. Um, when I was first given the news of um, the diagnosis from my MRI, it was a phone call from a physician whom I had never met. Now, it was the day after Christmas, oddly, that I went for the MRI. And when I came home, about an hour later, I had gotten a call Um and it was the on-call provider. And um, there were a million different ways that she could have given me that news. Um, she could have asked me, you know, are you sitting down? Do you have someone with you? Are you alone? Do you have a pen and paper? Um, you know, just somehow braced me for that news. But it was very like all business. Got your MRI. Don't know how much you talked to my colleague about what could be causing this. But it looks like a glioma. It's on your brain stem. You're going to need to see an oncologist um, probably on Monday and not like what questions do you have for me? How does that feel? (laughs) Um, These are some things that, you know, this is a significant piece of news. I realize that, but this is what you should or shouldn't do with this news. Like, don't go on the Internet. Um, That'll scare you or, you know, anything. Um, and, And I experienced that, too, you know, at that other health system that I went to in New York City where. I asked the physician pretty pointedly, is this something that will will kill me? And she, without hesitation, said, oh, my, yes. And again, didn't give me a way to absorb that news um, in, in any kind of, um, you know, uh, helpful, you know, just, you know, she she should have been talking to me like I was her daughter or her sister or a friend. Like she was just talking to me like I was just, you know, a um a widget an answer on a test yeah just an answer on a test just the facts ma'am and um so I wish that in those moments especially at the beginning of the journey I would have gotten a little more compassion and even when I went for my MRI I'd never had an MRI before um and I tried not to like think too much about it I was like okay I'll just get in this machine they'll do some buttons and it'll be over it was two hours and they didn't offer me like a a warm blanket, music, like now they do that. Now they give me everything and that's great. But I was like stone cold sober going into this thing. And I was, it, it, it was just terrifying. And so even just being able to talk me through it, the technician could have said like, this is a pretty long study. Have you had one of these before? Like there was nothing like that. It was just, they got me in the machine 15 minutes, if I even lasted that long, 10 minutes, maybe into it, I was squeezing the call bell, like, is this over yet? And, and the technician seemed like kind of annoyed at my questioning, (laughs) because she's like, are you kidding me? We just, we just got started. So anyway, I think that, again, it goes back to that analogy that if, if providers and staff could remember that for patients, this is not just another Monday, this is just not just another MRI to them, or clinic visit to them. This is a significant you know, moment and, and and a highly um, transformative moment, and not for everything, but for some of those like, you know, cancer visits, they really need to just, you know, take a take a minute and, and remember that these experiences for patients are in full color and they're watching and they're remembering a lot more in the journey than they probably are given credit for. What are some of the things that you tell people now when you encounter people who are in the same situation that you are or that you were? Yeah, well, I tell them, you know, number one, um, just don't lose faith. Um, And remember, there's always hope. Tell yourself it's going to be fine, except that it can be nothing else. Stay positive. Um, You know, try to block out the noise if you can. It's okay if you're if you don't want to google your your diagnosis it's okay it's okay if you do do what feels right for you um it's all right if you don't feel like you want to join a support group that's not your thing that's okay um but stay true to what makes you you know 
what fills you up and what kind of gets you through moment to moment, take it day by day. Um, and don't pay attention to the statistics because the statistics aren't everything. Um, they're something and they're significant. They're not nothing, but they're not everything. Um, and so, you know, everyone has, I believe, just my belief, everyone has a journey. It's probably predetermined at birth. Um, and in the end, no matter what your diagnosis, stage four, you know, metastasized lung cancer, um, you're all still, we're all still unknown, right? I think we're all on that same even level playing field. When you get cancer, you feel it, it takes so much from you. You feel robbed. You feel like your future, your hope is just like gone. And it feels very unfair. And, um, and people, you know, patients certainly have a right to feel bitter about that. But just remember, if you choose to believe it, the greater the storm, <laughs> this is the big lesson of the book, the brighter the rainbow. And if you have faith to believe that that storm will produce the greatest rainbow of your life, it takes hard work to get there. But I choose to to believe that. And so that's the other advice that I like to give people is that just remember this storm may clear your path. It'll cause some disruption. But if you choose to see it this way, this may end up producing the rainbow for you that you never otherwise would have received. And that yeah. leads well into my final question was, <laughs> which was going to be why the rainbow? What does that mean? Did you what mm -hmm. sparked that initial comparison for you? I always saw rainbows as a sign of hope, as a sign of opportunity. And, you know, I, I think like a, a virtual, like a real rainbow, which is really just reflection from the sun shining through the rain. It's kind of cheesy, but that is really the take home, you know, message for me that I was able to get to the rainbow. I was able to see the possibility and the hope after the storm. Um, and really holding on to that hope, you know, and in the end, you know, that's the best we can do with anything that's thrown our way if if we choose to see it that way. Um, and I know that's easier said than done. I certainly had my moments of why me, why this, feeling bitter. But eventually, you know, I came to wrestle that down and see, OK, this is not just remission, but this is a remission of having climbed the mountain, gotten through the storm, found the summit safe place to land and the rainbow is here in front of me and part of that rainbow is sharing this story for whatever it can offer people hope um, inspiration small comfort that's really uh, what I wanted to offer with this thank you so much for being here and for sharing your story it's a tremendous journey and I'm so happy that you're here to tell it with us I thank you it's been a pleasure thank you so much for having me and thank you all for watching we'll talk to you soon bye-bye